For six years, Daph De Juan has been building a co-working super community of entrepreneurs and professionals working on some of the most exciting business ideas in Pakistan. Through Daph De Juan Fireside Chats, we aim to learn and get inspired by these incredible leaders. Today, we are welcoming Fatma Asad Sayed, CEO of Abacus Consulting. I'm your host, Faryal, and this is Daph De Juan Fireside. Fatima is an integral member of the top leadership at Abacus Consulting, a leading international professional services firm committed to transforming clients by delivering world-class technology consultancy and outsourcing solutions. Over more than 24 years, Fatima's professional experience embodies thought leadership and delivering innovative solutions in corporate governance, digital transformation, strategic change, human capital management, enterprise technology solutions and project leadership across multiple sectors and industries. That was a mouthful, and that has been, a <laughs> and clearly there's been so much that you've been doing. Um, thank you so much for being here and being part of this. Um, we really wanted to kick off today by asking you, you know, all of these amazing things that you've been up to. You know, how did you get started in this career? Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to be here and the opportunity to engage with everyone. Um, so the journey started, I would say, during the academic, uh, my academic career. Towards the end of my MBA, where I sort of, um, you know, it became very discerning and very real that all the case studies that we did, no matter which discipline it was, whether it was marketing or technology or um, operations management, it came back to that person. Hmm. You know, the decision of the CEO, the decision of the sales officer, the customer, and I felt the human element was so powerful. So no matter what organizations may have, which is very important in terms of governance and structure and systems yeah. and policies, the human factor defined the journey of the organization. It made or it broke organizations essentially because it is the human element that drives the culture yeah. and the mindset and behaviors within any entity, whether it's academic or uh, in the corporate sector. So that got me uh, thinking and it was just towards the end of my MBA that I decided to make a shift um, and take a chance on HR. So and up until your MBA, you were thinking professional services like financial services or something of the sort? On the financial services side, definitely. Most of my modules were more finance related rather than any other discipline. Of course, at that time, it was a more of a general MBA. Okay. But I was leaning more towards the finance uh, discipline. So it was interesting and I feel I've never regretted that decision. Uh, even though at that time, I'm now talking late 90s, uh, 97 is when I, 1997 is when I uh, graduated uh, from LUMS and HR was still in its infancy stage. It was more personnel and administration, not really considered a career. Mm. In Pakistan, there were very few and far between uh, opportunities as well. It was taking a risk and it was taking a chance. Hmm. The good news was that there was an option in Lahore. My parents were particular that I, if I were to work, um, I work in Lahore. Yeah. Um, and I didn't have the option to look elsewhere. So Abacus at that time was the representative firm. Uh, it was the member firm, excuse me, for Coopers and Librand. Okay. And we had a human resource consulting uh, practice area. So it just sort of uh, made sense for me to join over there because predominantly most of the multinational companies had their head offices in Karachi. Yeah. And at that time I couldn't go. So that's how the journey started. Very interesting. You mentioned your upbringing a few times there, um, particularly about, you know, the parent side yeah. or the family side being in financial services or being professional services. And then I'm also, you know, talking about you Staying in Lahore, a lot of us can, can kind of relate to that parents constricting us, give a jana, wahani jana, yeah. whatever. But how did your upbringing help you um, in kind of breaking the glass ceiling uh, professionally? Well, I believe I've been very lucky and very privileged that my father's been the biggest supporter in terms of equal opportunity. That's a philosophy that he has maintained in the workplace as well. But when we were growing up, I'm fa part of five siblings, three brothers and two sisters, mashallah. And he always maintained that equal opportunity for both my daughters and my sons. 
um, you study as much as you want to and then of course you have to get married. So that was obviously part of the deal. But he never stopped us from exploring whatever avenues. And I really believe uh, that spearheaded uh, the kind of opportunities I went into because one, my initial schooling was abroad. We were based in the Middle East till my secondary schooling. That impacted the way I thought as well, you know, in, in essentially a school which was co-ed and multicultural. Um, and that does have an impact when you're growing up as a teenager in terms of your diverse thought process as well as being able to, I think, function and have creative ideas which are beyond a homogeneous uh, environment. Two, coupled with the value system of sort of making sure you're committed to excellence in everything that you do. I got an opportunity to go to different institutions, some of the finest in Pakistan yeah. as well, and made friends who have been with me, my cheerleading squad, yeah. I say, for the last 35 years. So there's always a silver lining to everything that happens. The value system my parents uh, uh, taught us has been instrumental and is continuously continues to be an instrumental in terms of how I take decisions and look at life in general. Yeah. Um, to be able to pick yourself up when things are not going your way. And yeah. there have been incidents. I mean, you know, there are always challenges in one's lives. What do you think, though, is the most important skill that you've developed uh, that's helped you, you know, be in this leadership role today? Um, I believe I focus on continuous learning and increasing one's knowledge in terms of defining the value that one can create. That's very important. The leadership journey is not just about leading teams and having that designation. Mm. It's about having the emotional intelligence to understand that when you are in a room, what value are you creating? And what does it mean for you to be in that room? And that means you have to be prepared, you have to be well researched, and you have to have faith in yourself that you were chosen on merit to be in that moment. Yeah. And once you walk into that door, in, in that door or into that room, then define yourself through your performance, irrespective of gender. I always judge myself before I judge anyone. I say, I'm the one who did not do this right. Mm. And even though I've been told not to be so harsh on myself, but I feel that's where, you know, that's where the greatest learning takes place. Is that where your drive comes from, would you say? Yeah, the self-awareness yeah. of who you are and what you can do and what your limitations are, quite yeah. frankly. It also keeps you grounded. But um, how do you do that? How do you keep on check, give a, you know, uh, no, this hasn't... What are those expectations that you've set yourself, almost? Where do they come from? Well, I mean, as I, again, it goes back to the upbringing to for that drive to do better hmm. um, and to aim for the stars, essentially. Yeah. That's, that's a, it's a thought process, it's an ethos that you have to work on. It doesn't happen overnight. It, it takes experience, a few knocks, yeah. maturity, um, yeah. because at different stages we are awkward, we are embarrassed about certain situations. We are also very... Um, sort of uh, conscious of the fact that we're being judged, yep. especially uh, in our teen years and then university and even early on in our, in our professional careers, yeah. uh, if we look back. And it's just through experience that we learn that how do we need to strengthen ourselves in terms of the self-awareness. And then just like we set goals in the workplace mm. and we have KPIs, yeah. do a self-evaluation. It, no one needs to know. Yeah. Keeping a journal is extremely, even though I'm very bad at keeping a journal, I must say. But Terrible. I keep telling myself. <laughs> but there have been random incidents uh, during different uh, points in my life that I would just jot down a few goals. And interestingly enough, I would see that many years later. And alhamdulillah, at, at times I feel I've achieved that. And at times I believe it was great that that particular incident did not work out. Mm. You know, so there's always a silver lining. Yeah. As a leader, your circle of influence matters a lot. And women in the workforce are not able to avail the same networking opportunities, um, especially in formal ones, as uh, I'm sure a lot of us would agree, as their male colleagues. Sorry, guys. Um, in this scenario, uh, how can female leaders help other women climb the ladder to the top? Hmm. 
It's a very good question and uh, very pertinent to how uh, organizations are framing their diversity, equity, and inclusion mandate. Um, one, within an organization, it's the tone at the top, yeah. which sets the culture and the set of policies and processes which will ensure an inclusive approach. Mm. The other aspect is to ensure that there are women champions and male champions within the organization because I, I'm a believer of partnerships and it's not us versus them, it's about how can we collaborate to build an environment which is conducive um, and allow the, uh, each gender to grow with the respect and dignity, uh, dignity mm -hmm. that's awarded to. The second is to be cognizant of the fact that women by and large, um, and studies also show this, are, and globally, I'm not just talking about the Pakistan context, globally, women tend to um, be the primary caregivers yeah. of either to their children or to their elderly or you know members of the community or society within their families. So the more organizations are conscious of that fact, that is where inclusion comes in. Inclusion is not just giving maternity leaves. Yeah. Inclusion, inclusion is identifying females who can be one, um, uh, identify, uh, sorry, recruited into the organization, but also consciously developed into leadership roles, at the same time being aware that they have to take career breaks at time, or there are times where they have to slow down, yeah. because maybe they're having a, obviously a family, yeah. um, there are other challenges as well. That is where mentorship and coaches, women coaches within an organization are essential to be facilitated of the fact that this, uh, this lady needs a bit of time yeah. uh, instead of the one year annual goal plan which is maybe easier for the ma male colleague counterpart to achieve, she will need two years to achieve, achieve that and you build that, that consciously and have that as part of the conversation within the organization. The second element is to uh, make sure that you, in, you invite the other females who are in that position where either they are aspiring for leadership roles yeah. or um, they would like to engage with a broader uh, audience. A broader audience. Uh, we're very lucky at this stage because of the virtual connect. Post-COVID, the silver lining is that we have access to virtual meetings. Yeah. And I myself have been part of many, um, at a global level, many engagements where I'm part of this uh, network which is women executives on boards um, and they meet regularly on a monthly basis and I haven't met and some of them on a one-to-one -one basis they're all the way on the other side of the world essentially so if that can happen on a global level I'm sure we can do this yeah. uh, in Pakistan and it is happening it's just that you need to find the right connectors yeah in terms of Abacus Consulting and you know you obviously having uh, such a huge impact talking about that tone from the top. What kind of changes are you guys making internally? What's Abacus Consultant doing about diversity and inclusion, which is such a big thing right now globally? Um, how are you guys adapting to that here in Pakistan? Well, I must say that I'm very proud to share that right from inception, we've always had this clause in our policy manual, even though the policy man manual may have evolved over the last 35 years. But that clause, one of the clauses that has remained constant is equal opportunity for all. And it makes you think that irrespective of gender and diversity is not just gender, it's yeah. culture and nationality and religion, etc., and age now, yeah. the generational aspect as well. Um, to maintain that in all policies yeah. from an inclusion perspective is not easy. Yeah. And we have been able to do that, mashallah, in terms of the way our HR policies are from the time of recruitment to development as well. We've strengthened that over the last few years. Um, in, we've also been awarded the Diversity and Inclusion Awards as best practice and progressive organization amongst the top 10 uh, multinationals and national companies within Pakistan Fantastic. and that's a global award and it happens every year um, as well. Um, we've just recently launched uh, women uh, uh, 
you know, leadership program within Abacus as well. Um, one of our KPIs at the corporate level, at the board level is, what is the ratio right now? We have 30% to 70%, that's 30% women, women yeah. within the organization as well. I'm hoping that that will increase to 40, 60 over the, last cup, in the, over the next couple of uh, uh, years. Um, but also consciously ensuring that at the time of recruitment, our leaders were 10 different business areas. So it's not just one practice, it's spread across technology, outsourcing and consulting. Okay. And each, of, each business has a different mandate, different dynamic. Essentially, we're a project-based organization working with clients within yeah. Pakistan and internationally as well. And in that, to identify the right skill set is a challenge mm. because when you recruit, you recruit on merit. Yeah. But yeah. at least you have to have if you're looking at top three candidates, at least one female hmm. candidate. And that's how you're making sure. And that's how we're making. That's at the time of acquisition. Right. Then there's a time of development as well. So I repeatedly send a message to our practice leaders, uh, the business leaders within our organization, that at the time of promotions, at the time of evaluation, are you consciously building capacity hmm. for our women leaders? And, the, and to have more women at senior leadership positions. Right now, other than myself, um, we have one more director who leads one of our practice areas, our corporate uh, strategy and corporate finance area. Uh, but we have a few in the upper middle management. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see more, of course. So it's, it's about how do you collaborate internally and have programs which are conducive. But at the same time, maintain the meritocracy yeah. of the organization in terms of excellence. What is that one key experience for you that shaped your thought process um, and changed the way you thought about the world? There's so many the other day when we were having the conversation and then words, there's... Words and thoughts were just flying in. <laughs> absolutely. And uh, I, I think that was... Uh, that made me think as well. One of the defining moments was this opportunity to intern at the UN in Geneva during my MBA career. Yeah. And, the, and I was in the United Nations Economic uh, Trade Division, uh, the only Asian uh, in that particular team of interns. Typically, that's what they do at the UN every summer. And it was a fascinating experience uh, to be working with one of the senior directors of the United Nations and in such a multicultural environment where, which is very different from back home as yeah. well. And having the uh, opportunity to engage with different nationalities from, from the Europe, uh, European continent um, and just just focus on the fact and also, you know, have that opportunity to go into the sessions over there. Right. Um, meet delegates from who were representatives of their uh, respective countries as well. And it just again hit me that human nature is the same, no matter what your nationality is. Mm. Wherever you may go, the, the way people interact um, is similar. Yeah. And that also went into um, identifying my own strengths, that I can engage with people very well, but I can also add value to them. What does success mean to you then? I, I don't look at success as a destination. I look at success as a journey where there are different points in life uh, which you believe that you are content and happy with and the decision that you made really impacted the lives of those around you in terms of how you've um, defined your world. So whether it is from a work professional perspective or from a personal perspective, have you really created value and you're authentically contributing yeah. uh, to not only doing good, but taking that organization or that person to the next level. That is what is success. The second element is how do you bounce back from your failures? Mm. That was my next question, actually. Yeah. You know, what does failure mean to you? So then, that's... Failure is a great teacher. Yeah. That's what it means to me. Um, because it teaches you how to deal with your emotions. There will always be another opportunity for you to do better tomorrow. Yeah. But don't lose that lesson that was there. 
maybe it 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 happened to teach you um, how to become stronger mm -hmm. and how to manage your uh, emotional responses better. I don't say reaction; I say responses. There's a difference. Yeah, we react a lot, even as a nation. I think we love our drama and <laughs> we love the drama behind everything that happens in our country. Um, sensationalize yeah, everything. Yeah, I mean, we sensationalize everything. So that kind of sells, as they say, bad news sells. But we don't really process, yeah. um, you know, how are we supposed to be responding? Hmm. And I really have faith in this next generation because I believe they are somehow more responsible, more aware of the purpose of why we exist as well. Mm -hmm. So failure also teaches you to sort of build that self-awareness which you asked right at the beginning. Yeah. That self-awareness comes with maturity. So this is my last question uh, before I, I reach out to all of you. Um, what advice would you give your younger self? Looking back now, all of these years, all of these experiences later, what would you tell yourself? Be bold enough to take decisions, not be indecisive. Um, I learned many lessons because of the indecisiveness I had. Um, which was an innate part. There are still times where I second guess myself, but it was much more when I was much younger. Um, and I guess that is also experience, but it's also driven by expectations of others right. who are important to you. Um, we have to cut out the noise of pleasing everyone yeah. because you can never please everyone. But at least know who is your world. I keep on uh, saying, you know, what is your circle of influence and define that. But take a decision. Either way, yes or no. Yeah. Even if it was not a good decision, but at least knew you took a decision and that will build confidence. So I would definitely tell myself that uh, just keep the faith and take that decision. Because at the end of the day, Honestly, none of us are in control of anything. It's our creator who is in control. So you do well, take that decision, leave the rest to God and miracles can happen. Tie your camel and leave the rest to God. That's Absolutely. Good, good ending to that one. Yes. Um, thank you so much. We're going to open up to Q&A. If anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. Two is, I believe in a support network. It's not just me who's done it alone, quite frankly. I uh, understood that very early on in my career as well. Um, the narrative has to, cannot be us versus them. It has to be how can we work together to build a support system. And there's some times where you have to step back and there's some times that the other person has to step back as well for us to enable each other to grow. Uh, thirdly, on the patriarchy, when I have conversations on patriarchy, I feel that one needs to be discerning on what is the experience of that other person mm. and does it really apply to my situation and then see if someone is going through that, how can you help? That is why women building women is so important and studies show worldwide that women are not very supportive of each other, which is very unfortunate. So when you're in the room, leave that gender at the door and be in the room and be prepared for why you're there. 30 minutes ki meeting here, what are you contributing? And if nothing needs to be said, don't say it. So it is a struggle and we, we need to definitely be a bit more bolder. When you talk about creating excellence, um, it's intangible when you make that statement. But what makes it happen is the value system and the culture that exists within an organization. That means it's not just the leader, the CEO, or the C-level SWE, which is constantly sending out these messages, they're demonstrating it. So it's about demonstrated capability. We all like to um, pitch ourselves mm. from a perspective of, oh, I can do this. But when it comes to what you, have you really delivered, that's a different conversation. So, excellence ki baat aa jati hai ke, are you really 
um, creating that environment of excellence, that's one thing, demonstrated capability. The second element is empowering people. So empowerment is not easy, delegation is not easy. Um, the art of delegation is also a skill set because what you're doing is something that you have acquired over several years, which you can now do in one or two days, you are trusting someone to take a week, make mistakes, and perhaps not measure up to that. But what you're doing is you're trusting them to gain their own experience. So empowering individuals to learn themselves is also a journey towards excellence as well. And the last one is um, working with integrity. Because what is integrity really? Doing the right thing when no one's looking. But be true to yourself. Set your own bar very high. So it's a, it's a combination of the individual objectives and ethos and the organization's ethos. My own personal commitment to give back to the community. So the two non-for-profit, one of two profit, the non-for-profit, sorry, uh, organizations that I sit on is Kash Foundation and Caravan Crafts. So their mandate is that, you know, women inclusion, women in financial empowerment as well as vocational uh, uh, skill set training for the rural women of Pakistan as well, and semi-urban. So I feel over the last at least five, six years, if not more, I think more than that now, seven, eight years, say, uh, this is on the personal side as much as, um, you know, institutional building is very important in our area. When you build institutions, there is continuity and sustainability. Hai. And then you can impact the livelihoods. Thank you so much. There were so many questions today and actually probably I thought some of them were a bit better than my own questions to be honest but thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for listening to our Fireside Chat today. For more on Fireside Chats like this with other leading women please follow us and subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as all of our social media. Thank you so much. Take care.